the world of Adventure Time has always felt alive. By that, I mean whenever time passes between episodes, it always felt like the characters, even the minor ones, would continue to live their lives while off-screen. Adventure Time's cast has always been dynamic and ever-changing, and as a result, the world feels like it evolves over time, even when we aren't there to witness it. The series finale, Come Along With Me, takes this transformative aspect and runs away with it 1,000 years into the future. We've seen glimpses of this future multiple times before, but the concept that life goes on in this fictional universe intermingles with the finality that this is the last time we'll get to watch it unfold. The last episode of Adventure Time begins with a reminder that things come to an end. The ruins and relics of the pre-Mushroom War era have been replaced with the ruins and relics of the Land of U we once knew, and we begin the series finale not with Finn and Jake, but with Shermie and Beth. But before I talk about those two bozos, let me revisit the new custom opening for the finale real quick. I already made a video about it quite some time ago, but I missed something cool in literally the first few opening frames of animation. Also, Steve Wolfhard posted an interesting comment after that video was created, which leads to a lot more connecting of the dots. To those heavily into fan theories and speculation, I'm sure the following will be nothing new to you, especially since the finale premiered like eight months ago, but I still want to talk about this as I find it very neat. To quote Wolfhard, I wanted to include a new fire elemental and slime elemental to give closure on Flame Princess and Slime Princess. The other elementals are accounted for in the intro. So first off, if you take Wolfhard's comments as canon, which you may as well, there's little reason not to, then Flame Princess and Slime Princess are confirmed to have died. I would imagine most of us assume this already. They don't have the immortality trait of Princess Bubblegum, nor would they preserve themselves in cryostasis like Patient St. Pym, whose protective ice ball has yet to thaw in Ooze's future. That was the thing I missed in the first few frames of the opening. That Patience is literally right there. These two battling creatures, they would be the new fire and slime elementals. If we assume these two elementals are still in charge of their respective kingdoms, the Fire and Slime Kingdom may be at war with one another in Ooze's future. So that just leaves the Candy Elemental, Bubblegum. Guess it's pretty obvious who these pink hands belong to now. The Ice Thing is kidnapping Princess Bubblegum, just as Ice King used to do in the days of old. And that just leads us to connect the dots that this character might be Marceline, trying to save PB, as Finn and Jake are obviously no longer alive to take care of that task. The Stone Duck is from her debut episode, as I mentioned in my video on the intro, and that does feel like a deliberate clue placed to suggest this is Marceline, in addition to the markings on the monocular being M.A., which could stand for Marceline Abadir. In prior episodes, she marked her name with just an M, but at the start of the series, she also had a very rocky relationship with her father, and that has since been hashed out a bit. At least enough for her to hang a portrait of him in her house. So hey, maybe in the future, she now takes pride in her last name and uses M.A. for her initial. Lots of people all across the internet have come to this conclusion in the weeks following the finale, and I have to say, I agree with it. Especially since there's a complete lack of an alternative explanation backed by evidence. I think it's very safe to conclude this is indeed Marceline trying to save her partner from the ice thing. I bet Marceline has to bust Bubblegum out fairly regularly. This is probably a recurring event, considering that classic Ice King was a chronic kidnapper until he became semi-reformed, and the opposite of that seemed to have happened to the Ice Thing, referred to my video on the pups. So yeah, those were the additional comments on the custom opening that I wanted to squeeze in before we move on to the rest of the review. The finale starts with Shermie and Beth having a picnic. While Shermie and Beth are the new stand-ins for Finn and Jake, and continue the legacy of the fun will never end, it's not clear whether we can consider them full-blown reincarnations of Finn and Jake. It's pretty much up to the viewer to decide, and it would not be the first time there's an extremely strong allusion to such a relationship without confirmation either way. 
Beth is a descendant of Jake and Lady Rainicorn, though, and I've got to say that reincarnating into the same general species of creature is a tad boring for me as far as reincarnation in the Adventure Time world goes. The vague essence of a person that reincarnates can become any being, so when it comes to my personal preference, I'd prefer a bit larger of a biological gap. As for Shermie, well, again, we can consult Wolfhard's notes, and there's a bit of an implication that he might just be Finn's direct reincarnation. Wolfhard writes that he made Shermie a cat due to dialogue from Finn in the episode Mortal Recoil. I'm a cat! I'm an agile cat! <laughs> Jake! Duck! <laughs> Meow, Ice King! It's always been fun for me how little one-off bits of dialogue in Adventure Time often give rise to new ideas way further down the line. Attending the picnic at the episode's start is also Princess Zip, who's related to those aliens that appeared in the episode High Strangeness. You know, the ones that had hybrid children with tree trunks and helped bubblegum seed candy life on other planets just in case it ever goes extinct on Earth. Princess Zip, being an established princess in Ooh, is further evidence that space travel to and from Earth has become even more commonplace 1,000 years in the future. Since it appears the planet has become an intergalactic hub of sorts, perhaps life on planet Earth is even more diverse than ever before due to new extraterrestrial inhabitants making it their home. Although, alternatively, future Ooh appears to be in an even more post-apocalyptic state than former Ooh, so who knows how much life failed to survive into the post-apocalyptic conditions we see now. It's all ripe for our own imaginations to fill. I think the main reason Future Ooh feels like it's on the more recent side of an apocalyptic event is simply the color scheme. While the former Land of Ooh was also filled with ruins of the past at nearly every turn, it was always so lush, vibrant, and gaudy. In the future, Ooh visually appears more dreary and bleak, with a sky that's painted in grey tones when it's not completely covered by ashen clouds. Even the final shot of the episode, which has the sun directly behind Shermie and Beth, retains the faded color scheme and sullen sky. Perhaps the latest apocalypse was caused in part by climate change, or if not, whatever did cause it certainly led to climatic changes and polluted the atmosphere. As I already said, it's all ripe for the imagination. So, Shermie and Beth try and fail to trip the gigantic prize ball guardian that strolls across the landscape, and the technologically souped up flying banana guard hovering over its shoulder makes me think the events we witness with Shermie and Beth chronologically take place shortly after the events we saw in the episode Grable's 1000 Plus. Cuber's shenanigans caused the partial destruction of the prize ball guardian, so I figure Princess Bubblegum wanted an extra set of eyes, or an extra two sets of eyes? Do these things even technically have eyes? Anyway, PB likely didn't want a similar scenario to repeat, so she added an extra layer of security to the prize ball guardian. Later in the episode, we see the first deployment of Banana Guard 500s for the Gum War, and this future Banana Guard seemed to be the next installment in that series, and apparently based on the logic that two heads are better than one. Anyway, Shermie and Beth uncover Finn's robotic arm, and while it doesn't hold the same meaning for them as it does for the audience watching the show, they still hold the object with a degree of reverence. It's beautiful! Let's take it home and I'll learn about it with my brain. You and your brain! The several minutes we have with Shermie and Beth repeatedly establish that Shermie is brash, energetic, and immature, while Beth is the more thoughtful, composed, and laid-back one. While their dynamic is obviously reminiscent of the early Finn and Jake, where Jake often took the role of pseudo-guardian for preteen Finn, from what we've seen thus far, Shermie might just be even more puerile than 12-year-old Finn was, and that's saying a lot. Beth, on the other hand, is definitely more focused and grounded than Jake, which I'm sure she has to be in order to keep Shermie out of too much trouble. Shermie is still physically lacking and might not be able to punch buns as well as Finn could. Beth is also a tinkerer based on all the various tools and knickknacks sprawled around what was formerly Marceline's house, which is where the two reside. Her to-do list also demonstrates the sort of handiwork she engages in around the house, and that she's the one who keeps their home in suitable condition for living. Fix sink, drain bathtub, upgrade generator, and of course, you can't forget to mash them taters. 
Shermie appears to lean toward the arts as a hobby, as there's tons of drawings up all over the walls. Shermie's art skills, though, they leave something to be desired. Keep on practicing, little dude. I guess I should also mention, lest people yell at me that I missed it, that Jake's Tropical Island song from Season 3 was somehow preserved into the future. On a tropical island, underneath a molten lava moon, hanging with the hula dancers, asking questions cause they got all the answers. Putting on lotion, sitting by the ocean, rubbing it on my body, rubbing it on my body. On a tropical island, on a tropical island. That was an amusing little musical reference. Guess he must have sent it to his pups at some point, and the tune stuck. Speaking of references, apparently the king of Ooo lives atop Mount Kragdor, which is where Finn got the Enchiridion all the way back in Season 1. We get the best kind of bait and switch, because apparently Bemo now calls himself the King of Ooo, and I don't know about you, but honestly, I'd much rather see Bemo in the future than the lump of wax that formerly went by King of Ooo. By the way, I adore that Bemo has a guillotine atop his house. That's amazing. Inside Bemo's house, there are so many objects we've seen throughout the course of the show. Apparently, Bemo is a bit of a hoarder for the days of old. My personal favorite items of the bunch include the helmet of Grob, Gob, Glob, and Grod. God, I still struggle to say their names. The casket of the Jiggler, which presumably also contains the deceased body of the Jiggler? Finn's grass arm that ripped off in the episode Escape from the Citadel. I would love to know the story of how Bimo acquired this item, as it could have ended up potentially anywhere in the universe. And last but not least, Bimo has the maid. For some reason, Bimo has Prismo's extremely powerful interdimensional tool from the episode Crossover. Again, I'd love to know how the hell Bimo got his grubby little mitts on this object. Also, because of Bimo, the book Mind Games by J.T. Dogzone continues to exist in the distant future. For Glob's sake, just burn that accursed item, Bimo. Burn it! I've said some of my favorites, but pointing out every item would take way too long. But Steve Wolfhard, he's a real MVP when it comes to concept art for the finale. He already uploaded images with every prop labeled for anyone curious about identifying them all. So if you want to see these images in higher resolution, I provided a link in the video description that you can follow to get to them. Shermie and Beth wreaking destruction on Bemo's collection was hilarious, although my heart did sink a little when the skull of poor old deceased Mr. Fox got shattered. Be careful, this stuff isn't ours. Whoop! Uh... Another highly humorous but mildly upsetting moment is when Bemo fails to remember the name of none other than Frank the Human. So normally, Bimo is an extremely unreliable narrator. Not too many episodes ago, we saw what happens when Bimo recounts events that happened only recently. However, it's pretty safe to overlook that concept in this specific scenario. Bimo telling the story is more of a thematic and structural framework. Bimo's biased perspective does not become part of the narrative itself. Basically, I'm just saying that the events we witness as an audience are accurate representations. I don't know exactly what Shermie and Beth hear, that's a whole different story, but what we see on screen is reliable, especially since Bimo wasn't even there to witness most of it directly. So let's talk about those events. Let's finally talk about the Gum War. And so the princess was mother to her own uncle, and that made him mad. Finn is still against the war, but is at his wit's end to think of how to achieve a peaceful resolution, resorting to weak sentiments about bad omens in the sky. Which, those omens, won't actually matter until the war is already resolved. Finn's quest to avoid the conflict has pretty much become an obsession. He seems to be operating on more of a primal gut feeling than anything else, committing to his instincts that the war will set a bad precedent for the future regardless of the result. This is all wrong. Even if she wins now, this is never gonna end. I can feel it. It's like the whole world's going crazy, man. 
While I'm unsure how much conscious thought Finn has given it, his worries are not without merit. The Candy Kingdom under Princess Bubblegum has always had an imperialistic vibe to it when not outright being imperialist, and PB has always desired an extreme level of control not just over her own citizens, but even over other kingdoms. She almost ended up at war with the Fire Kingdom after all, since she chose to meddle in their foreign affairs and mess with the sacred relics to make them less of a potential threat to her. While it's undeniable that Gumbald is an ass, a lot of what he has done has already been carried out by Princess Bubblegum to even greater extents. PB is quite notorious across the land of Ooh for her iron rule and desire for control, and wiping out a neighbor faction for acting in the same manner she herself used to, and still kinda does to an extent, that's not exactly a good look. To go on a bit of a tangent here, and I might talk about this more in a future video, but I think one possibility of why PB shut herself and her citizens away in the Price Ball Guardian in the future, maybe PB decided to withdraw from all the chaos in Ooh, rather than dedicate her life towards endlessly trying to control and conquer it. But I'll save more discussion on that topic for another time, let's get back to why Finn is against the gum war. While Gumbald is very much a villain, when he's trying to form a relationship with others, to manipulate them, he puts on a cheerful demeanor where he acts like he's your buddy, your cool, friendly uncle figure, not too dissimilar to the approach used by the Kinavu, an approach that amassed quite the following, may I remind you. We're not exactly sure what the average denizen of Ooh that isn't closely affiliated with any kingdom thinks of Gumbald, but it's probably safe to assume they don't view him anywhere near as harshly as Princess Bubblegum does. The argument I've been making for why Finn feels the way he does is undermined a bit though by the fact that Flame Princess and Slime Princess are willing participants in the gum war on Bubblegum's side. I guess the Ice Kingdom is technically siding with Gumbald, but, you know, not really. But regardless, the powers that be are basically all united against Gumbald and see him as an enemy. Of course, just because the rulers hold this view doesn't mandate that the populace of Ooh in general agrees, especially since none of the residents of the Fire Slime Kingdom seem to be joining in, just the two elementals. But I still do think if the conflict was kept purely between the two Candy Kingdoms and the other kingdoms stayed entirely out of it, that would have made a far stronger case to de-escalate the war through non-combative means. We are discussing Finn's gut feelings here though, so rational reasons aside, there are probably a lot of personal feelings mixed in. For one, obviously Finn doesn't want Princess Bubblegum to rely on war when things get tough. PB used to be this idealistic figure for Finn, but since he's grown up and matured, he realized she's human and can be prone to faults just like anyone else. And when you have an entire kingdom to maintain, those faults are very prone to manifesting. And PB's not actually human, but like, you know what I mean, let's, let's not be pedantic here. Let's reference the episode The Thin Yellow Line, where Finn actively worked to oppose PB because he assumed PB was going to unjustly punish someone. In this moment, Finn assumed the worst of PB because of her prior tendencies, and it wasn't exactly a bogus assumption on his part. I'm sure Finn thinks carrying out a war won't bode well for how Bonnie rules her kingdom in the future. Maybe he's worried she'll slip back into the harsher dictator that she once was. Then, in regards to Fern, there's Finn's own personal drama. That's probably not the best word for it, but whatever. Finn sees Fern as family, and desperately wants Fern to come around again and be friends with everyone else. I'm pretty sure Finn projects this desire onto Bubblegum and Gumbald, who are also each other's family. Finn sees his own struggle reflected in Bonnie's conflict with her uncle, so of course he would want things to resolve peacefully. So yeah, that's my attempt to dive into Finn's headspace and try to parse why he's so intensely opposed to the gum war. Finn is not the only one advising Bonnie to find an alternative. Marceline also makes an attempt. I love how Bonnie's preoccupied and headstrong demeanor briefly gives way when she's face to face with Marcy. All right, just make it quick. Please. Bonnabelle is putting up an austere front as commander, but going through with the war is not an easy task for her. It's an emotionally heavy toll, and it's a very nice detail that she only shows this brief glimpse of vulnerability when in the presence of Marcy. 
Marceline's request is succinct and sincere, and the smash cut during her appeal was powerful stuff. But I've lived through something like this once before, and... I'm just not really trying to help start that all up again. And while Bubblegum expresses sympathy, this of course is still not enough to sway her mind. Now on the other hand, somebody who seems to be dead set on carrying out the war effort and expresses strong dedication to the cause via direct action is Huntress Wizard. I mean, she's not on the enthusiastic level of, say, Colonel Candycorn or anything, but she seems to have a comparable level of conviction. I guess she must be extremely fed up with how much Gumball's creations have messed up the ecosystem she watches over, or something. So, I'm not going to mention every single amusing joke or comical moment that happens, but the lemon grab note does deserve a special mention because it was quite hilarious. So Finn decides that his final course of action is to use the vial of nightmare juice he acquired from Nightmare Princess to send the parties involved into the dream realm where they can hopefully hash out their problems. For Finn to already know what effect the juice has, there's an implication that somebody has already tried it out. My bet is Jake wanted to eat dream sandwiches at some point in the past. Princess Bubblegum agrees to the parlay because she is reminded of Shoko, and I personally didn't care for this reference. It felt rather arbitrary. Like, PB definitely feels guilty over what happened with Shoko because if she was more attentive, the tragedy may have been avoided, but it's not as if Shoko and PB disagreed over some course of action that led Shoko to her demise. There's not enough overlap in circumstances for the Shoko callback to feel appropriate in my opinion. I felt like it was thrown in because it's the series finale and there won't be any more time to bring up Shoko ever again, so they went with it even if it doesn't fit that cleanly. But the parlay happens, Operation Nightmare Juice is a go, and our characters end up dead. No, not dead. Some of the visuals here were neat, but a little underwhelming by Adventure Time standards. Given that five people are sharing the dreamscape, I figured the base room would be far more cluttered and bizarre, but the setting was rather plain, especially when compared to some of the excellent imagery we saw back in the episode Orb, or even in other dreams like the one Jake had in the episode Abstract. Creatively, I felt the background designs didn't match up to what we've seen before, and for a series finale, you generally want to go big for these sorts of things. I really did not like the singing poodle who was actually Cosmic Owl in disguise. To me, it was just awkward, but not the good kind of awkward. Like, not dream awkward, just, just awkward. The awkwardness continues when everybody covers their eyes because they expect the sudden burst of weird light to blind them, or something? I guess they assume it's gonna be like the solar flare technique from Dragon Ball, although in Dragon Ball nobody ever shuts their eyes against that attack for some reason even though it's really telegraphed. But whoa, I'm getting super off topic here. Anyway, Gumbald realizes everything's fine and just runs away. It was weird, and again, not dream weird, it just felt like incongruous storyboarding in my opinion. It was a rocky start to the dream adventure, but things do get a whole lot better and way more interesting as it goes on. Before I get to those events, I do want to point out, not the obvious mug that reflects how PB feels about her uncle, not how creepy the deceased Jake the Brick looks, although that is very unsettling and I love it, but what I want to point out is the note on the ground which states, I'm happier this way, signed by Cousin Chicle. Obviously, Chicle slash Crunchy isn't in the dream. This is representative of something from Gumbald's psyche. I think Gumbald feels some remorse. Somewhere deep inside him, there is regret over Chicle having to be a victim of the lobotomy juice again. Gumbald quells these feelings by thinking that Chicle is better off as Crunchy. Gumbald is engaging in some mental gymnastics, which manifests in the dream as this note. Uncle Gumbald does come off like a caricature of a character, but that's just because his lust for power and control completely overwhelms everything else. Gumbald is capable of having empathy, it's just that he's still willing to throw those feelings aside to get what he desires. Which is a trait that's shared in the Gum family. Bubblegum is literally about to myrtle an immobile fern after all. That's actually really dark. 
For one, Fern's not even the instigator of the war, but let's also remember, Fern up to a certain point in time was Finn. He kind of still is Finn in a way, which PB herself understands. She literally was the first one to understand this. So, that guy is definitely an alternate reality evil doppelganger, right? Huh, no, he's not even from a different timeline. Finn, he's just you. And yet, she's still ready to take the shot. She, in fact, tries to take the shot. Like, jeez, girl, you got war mania all up in your brainia. Seems like Finn was right about the war not being good for your mind. So, in response to Gumbald fleeing, Fern roots to the ground because he's emotionally shocked. He freezes in place and is overwhelmed because he's on the receiving end of a supposed family figure. You looking for an uncle? abandoning him yet again, which, of course, was a very painful event to deal with before. I don't like being abandoned! I'm sensitive to it! After the shock wears off, Fern takes flight as a pterosaur-ish thing, which almost seems abrupt after he took root just moments earlier, but I think it actually works. He goes from being frozen in place and not knowing what to do, to feeling like all the bonds he had were severed. He's no longer tied down by anyone, he no longer has connections to anyone, but he also feel like he doesn't belong anywhere, so he's experiencing an angry sort of freedom where he's just lashing out at everything around him. I'm gonna fly around and wreck things until I feel better! Or until I tire myself out! It works figuratively. I also think it's a neat little callback to the episode Orb, where Finn also flew and also was briefly rooted to the ground, although for different reasons than what Fern is experiencing now. To try and calm Fern down, Finn takes the form of a butterfly. And of course, it's only fitting for the butterfly appearance to match the butterfly that Finn was himself in a previous life. During all of this, Jake is screwing around with a dream germane that he conjured up. The real Germain would probably not be this silly in such dire circumstances, even if dreams do make it easy to get carried away. Also, this behavior from the conjured up dream Germain is representative that Jake feels he has a very wholesome relationship with his brother ever since the events of the episode Abstract, and this wholesomeness is both adorable and hilarious. Everybody gets an evil doppelganger but me. I'll be your evil doppelganger. Germain, you're the best! <laughs> <laughs> of course, Jake does come through to help by realizing that he needs to show Finn and Fern their collective vault in order to make Fern realize that Finn's words are not just empty platitudes. I'm tormented! I'm also that sometimes! Meanwhile, Bubblegum and Gumball's toothbrush jousting resulted in the two experiencing the past in each other's body. They switched psyches, so to say. They walked a mile in each other's shoes. Aren't dreams great? They can make the figurative literal. Gumbald gets to be the lonely child that had his own family turn on him and had to grow up alone, while Bubblegum gets to experience life under the influence of the lobotomy juice. And it was actually incredibly sad when both characters break down crying. I deeply felt the raw emotion present in that scene. The image of Gumbald melting into Bubblegum atop the ruined kingdom, with the cut to black reminiscent of when a light bulb goes out, that was some superb visuals and editing when it comes to evoking an emotional response. It was a very brief scene, but it packed such a strong punch, such an effective way to share the grief both of these characters feel. It was by far my favorite bit out of all the stuff that occurred in the dream realm. Jake had some really interesting experiences too though, and to boot, his were very open to interpretation. Jake and Lady appearing physically merged, despite the fact that Jake spends a considerable amount of time away from Lady, signifies that he nonetheless feels incredibly close to her. Although being merged to someone could imply that you're being smothered, I think for the most part, this is a positive representation, and it's good to remember that this happens before Jake's actual fears manifest. The manner in which Jake and Lady are joined does not inconvenience him, and he doesn't even seem that phased by it. I see this as Jake feeling that he and Lady have a close, intimate, and healthy relationship. Lady is even the one who brings him to the door where Finn's vault is buried, meaning Jake sees her as a very helpful and guiding component to his life. Before Jake was able to uncover Finn's vault, though, he had to first face some nightmares of his own. 
I chuckled at all the writing on the boxes. I wouldn't. No. Nah. Think again. Yeah, Jake has his own slew of stuff he'd rather keep closed. However, one of the boxes is labeled perhaps, which, yeah, that's the part I found really amusing. It's curious that the dirt and potted plants seem lifted directly from Magic Man's house. They are so strikingly similar. Maybe having been turned into a bowl of soup really traumatized Jake or something, I'm not exactly sure. Vampire Puppies is a pretty basic callback to Jake's fear of vampires, although I guess it could double up as a general fear of your children growing up to be bad people, or people who you no longer recognize, or people you can't relate to. The next bit, where Lady leaps forth to cook her children, is some very psychologically deep stuff, and feel free to take your own shot at psychoanalyzing this morbidly wacky scene. While both parents love their pups, we do know that Lady has stayed far more involved in their lives than Jake has. Lady has overall put more time and effort into raising them and staying in contact with them. This could potentially be a representation that Jake fears if the pups get into trouble, Lady would not be able to save them, but I feel that there's a more poignant and much darker repressed feeling that may be a play here. Maybe Jake fears that Lady raised the pups in a manner that left them unprepared for the dangerous world at large, which sort of is a generational extension of what Jake's parents kind of did to him in a way, and thus Jake may be projecting that fear onto Lady and the pups. As I already said, this scene is very open to interpretation because it deals with potentially irrational emotions you would rather bury and forget about. And I love this kind of stuff, even if it can be kind of hard to parse. As if this wasn't already traumatizing enough for Jake, he then gets a direct blow to his ego. Your farts aren't funny, Dad. No! Yeah, fart jokes. Gotta have one every now and then, I guess. But Jake's butt does come through and digs up Finn and Fern's collective vault. Ah, nightmare fart! Oh, what, what reeks? reeks? Repressed memories! My vault! Proof! Ah! I am actually a little surprised the crew decided to have only four images emerge from the vault, but I guess Finn has been putting in work to lighten it over the course of many seasons, and also this is the collective vault of both Finn and Fern, and would presumably leave out some of the stuff that would only apply to one of them. Everyone who appears has the eyes of the Emissary from beyond for obvious reasons, that's what the scene is building toward. The Lich wearing Billy's skin is a very obvious choice, and his appearance in the vault is incredibly straightforward. Honestly, the ultimate evil wearing the body of your beloved hero as a disguise? That's a ghoulish enough image to reserve a seat in someone's vault forever. That's the kind of shit that scars you for life. The creature Finn turned into in the episode Don't Look is there, which goes to show that while the support of friends allows Finn to feel positively about himself, the deep-rooted fears and insecurities that Finn has about being like his father remain. I already had a thorough discussion about this transformation in my review of Don't Look, so check that video out if you want to hear more on that subject. Now, whether having your insecurities be vaulted away is healthy, that's a whole other lengthy topic. I do think one needs to be aware of their potential faults and negative attributes in order to be mindful and counteract them, and merely blocking that stuff out might not be the best course of action, but this kind of stuff takes time to cope with and internalize in a healthy way, and Finn is still very young, so he's got plenty of time for that. Now in regards to Fern, there is the fact that Finn transformed into this Martin-like creature way after Finnsword came into existence. Fern did not directly experience turning into this monstrosity, but apparently he must have witnessed the whole event in the treehouse, and all those insecurities surfacing in Finn must have powerfully resonated with Fern for this creature to also be in Fern's vault. Even though it was a second-hand experience of sorts for Fern, I, I can buy this creature being in Fern's vault. I think that checks out. Muscled up Giant Susan from the episode reboot makes sense as well. Finn was pretty darn traumatized from having to fight a friend, being unable to stop her, and most of all from leaving her so egregiously injured by the battle's end. 
Fern was of course there for the whole thing too, still in the form of Finsword. And of course, the Grass Sword nearly killing Susan is what leads to the Grass Sword and Finsword merging into Fern in the first place. The battle with Susan was sort of ground zero for that event. Thus, the presence of Susan here represents a whole lot of repressed emotions for both lads, and I actually really like that she shows up in the vault. Last but not least, it's Princess Bubblegum! Just regular old Princess Bubblegum, good old Peebubs, or bad Peebubs, I guess in this case. This harks back to the whole gum war thing. Finn, and Fern too apparently, are both worried about Princess Bubblegum compromising her morals and sliding back into the role of an imperialistic dictator. And just in general, Princess Bubblegum is a person they both to an extent revere, but are also both afraid of. I really like that certain negative attributes of PB are extreme enough that they had to be vaulted away in the minds of Finn and Fern. Upon confronting their fears and torments, the boys cause the Emissary from Beyond to manifest in the Unconscious Realm, and apparently Finn really thought things through with this Nightmare Juice plan. Fern, this is why I brought us here. We can defeat him together. Not only did he intend for PB and Gumbald to reconcile and thus end the gum war with no bloodshed, but he also planned to rid Fern of the influence from the Grass Sword in the world of the Unconscious. While Finn has never seen the grass octopus spider thingy before, he is still well aware Fern's mind has been compromised by the influence of the grass sword. As the two dive deep into the vault, Finn hears the voice of Princess Bubblegum. No fear. While this might seem odd to some, considering that we just saw PB presented as evil emerging from the vault, this is actually super in line with what Adventure Time has been doing for quite some time now, and I've discussed this before in a couple videos. Finn's internal guiding compass, his conscience manifested, so to speak, takes the form of an idealized goddess Bubblegum who, by this point, is nearly completely removed from the actual person Bonnabelle Bubblegum. This is whose voice we hear, just like we have in episodes past. My hero arise, let love be your guide. At the seashell center lies the cornucopia's smallest door. Like I said, this is very different from PB as a person who Finn sees as a very close friend. And then, like I already talked about, there's also PB the Conqueror, the worst of which Finn locks away in the vault. But otherwise, he sometimes does try to balance the component of her that's a ruler with a preferred perspective he has of her as a beloved friend. But yeah, what I'm saying is, Finn's mind has essentially split PB up into three components. Bubblegum as his moral guiding compass, Bubblegum as his friend, and Bubblegum as a dictator. I actually plan to eventually do an entire video on the topic of the three bubblegums in Finn's mind, because I personally think it's pretty cool stuff. It's actually sort of funny, I once hypothesized that the cornucopia dialogue we heard from Goddess PB in the Hall of Egress may refer to Finn having to save the day by searching deep in his vault, and apparently I wasn't that far off. I mean, I wasn't that close per se, because back then I hypothesized it might be to save U, and that he would have to seek out something from his past life, but still, I mean, I was at least on the right track. And I actually think that's pretty cool, because back then, I thought I was reaching a bit. The bit of dialogue from the goddess Bubblegum voice at this exact moment, however, drives that connection pretty well, I think. The death of the Emissary from Beyond was quite comedic in how purposefully anticlimactic it was. Finn holds onto it while Fernfin just stabs it with the leg of a chair. Done and done. While comical, I do think it also goes to show that the hardest part is getting your mindset right. Identifying and confronting your fears is tough, but carrying out the task after that can oftentimes be quite simple. Once the two Finns are able to work in harmony, defeating the evil is actually very easy. After the Emissary is vanquished, we see that the weird poodle in a wig that appeared earlier was the Cosmic Owl all along, and it flies off with a snake in its mouth. The snake is a very deliberate detail, so it's pretty safe to apply what snakes are presumed to mean in dreams towards this whole situation. 
In Western thought, snakes in dreams are often inferred to signal danger, and there's that whole Judeo-Christian aspect where the snake is an evil tempter, which further ties in with shameful desires in general. So yeah, in that sense, it all ties quite cleanly toward representing the emissary from beyond as a malevolent creature that's being purged, a creature that tempted and corrupted and got the best of Fern's psyche. There's of course also a fairly common idiom that occurs in multiple languages, snake in the grass. The grass has been dispersed, and there's the snake. The figurative as literal. Like, come on, need I say more? I mean, I will say more, because there's also Eastern interpretations of what snakes can represent, which includes wisdom, renewal, and transformation. Fern is now unburdened from the influence of the Emissary from Beyond, and while tragically his life draws to a close, he is at least free. He sheds his skin, so to say, like a snake. Fern finally transforms into his own person figuratively, and then literally will go on to transform as well by the episode's end. So the snake in the mouth of the cosmic owl can be viewed as two-pronged symbolism, referring to both the purging of the emissary from beyond, as well as Fern being reborn anew. A small detail that goes a long way to reinforce the themes at play. Little touches like that are one of the many reasons I love Adventure Time. Our characters all end up on what can basically be called Epiphany Island. I love this imagery. What everyone experienced was akin to being lost and adrift in a volatile sea, and then finally finding land to stand on, becoming grounded once more. The imagery of washing up on an island works so well to illustrate what the characters are currently feeling. To bring up Judeo-Christian mythology again, P.B. and Gumbold are coughed up by a fish, a clear allusion to the story of Jonah and the whale, which has a central theme of redemption and second chances. It all just works so well, even if Gumbald chooses to still be a backstabbing bastard in the end. So yeah, Gumbald does not come out changed from the dream world. His conviction remains intact. He never was the epiphany type. The guy's complex is way too ingrained, so despite experiencing what Bubblegum felt throughout her life, his lust to be the only ruler of the Candy Kingdom remains. I can appreciate when villains have too much conviction, because not everyone can be redeemed, and some people are just unabashedly stubborn and bad. And usually what's portrayed is the hero's unwavering conviction saving the day, so it's nice when conversely a villain's unwavering conviction leads to their downfall. So while I can see how some people can think this resolution is a little lame, I personally have no gripes with it. Opportunistic Aunt Lolly is content with taking Gumball's spot and calling it a day, and thus... Two Candy Kingdoms it is! Hooray! We donked up for real. Yeah, I'm sure literally everybody saw that coming. It's finally time for Golb. It's Golb time, everybody. Oh no! I was pretty amused that upon the appearance of Golb, Marceline angrily assumes PB is somehow responsible. What did you do? It wasn't me! Despite how close the two have become since their reconciliation way back, they still aren't exactly in the business of giving each other the benefit of the doubt. I really appreciate that they're willing to hold the other accountable when things go bad. In my opinion, it makes their relationship dynamic feel far more real and fleshed out. Ice King failing to recall information about Golb, but we as an audience getting the expository flashback anyway, was a real hoot. The unexpected physical comedy had me bust out laughing. You want some cherries with that chocolate syrup? Oh, <laughs> sure. Catch! Simon's head injury aside, we do learn that Golb is a dank, semi-omnipresent entity that embodies chaos, which slightly explains Golb's appearance in the episode Puhoi, because Finn's headspace was certainly an extremely chaotic, festering mess at the time, to the point where he may have even subconsciously created an entire dream? question mark universe to escape to, and regardless of whether he created it or his escapism allowed him to traverse to it, crossing back to his home dimension via death and finding Golb in that interdimensional space seems like a pretty cool concept, honestly. 
As for the Lich calling himself the last scholar of Golb, well, you know what? I'd love to get into it, but I think I'm going to save that discussion for a video specifically about the Lich. I've always wanted to do a bunch of character study videos after Adventure Time ends, and the Lich will certainly be among those. And let's be honest, this finale review is already lengthy enough as it is. So, Golb. That red, weird, creepy, bare-bottomed baby. For the most part, Golb just sits there and stares blankly ahead throughout the whole finale. Its stanky demon breath transforms candy people into this abomination that spreads chaos and destruction across the landscape. This is actually the only creature Golb creates directly. After that first wave of bad breath, Golb just chills out amid all the pandemonium. The monster eventually turns one of the Gumballed Guardians foul, which in turn transforms Princess Bubblegum's jelly bean attack into these... Angry Birds? Yeah, that was kind of weird. It didn't really fit with the internal organ-inspired designs of the big monsters, and it's not exactly an interesting design anyway. It, it's just... it's just Angry Birds. I wish these had looked different. There was actually a whole lot more concept art for these biomass creatures than what ended up in the episode. And unfortunately, I think the unused concept art is way more interesting than what we got. Instead of the bland Angry Birds, I wish we could have had some of these fellas. This guy in particular. This guy is so morbidly grotesque. I love it. Marceline crushes the primary monster, and it still reanimates off-screen and just keeps on going as if it was never taken down. So one of the ways these other designs could have been implemented would be to have the creature reform into a new design every time it was defeated. Something else that bummed me out is that the Candy Kingdom haters Gumball assembled, which received quite a lengthy introduction, may I remind you, got absolutely no play whatsoever during the battle. We see them standing in place or running away in a few scenes here and there, but at no point do they actually fight. A case could be made that they were left out because there's probably not enough time in this four-part episode to squeeze in extra fluff content without negatively impacting the pacing of the key events that hold actual importance. The central characters allied with Bubblegum already got very brief screen time as is. While this argument does have some merit to it, I still feel like Scorcher could have been thrown in the background of some scene tossing fireballs. Small stuff like that would have been sufficient. The characters that are cowards could have still been trying to avoid getting killed in ways that are interesting or amusing. Just a few brief glimpses of these characters actually doing something proactive in the background would have been nice. I mean, potentially we could have had a giant busy action scene where the camera quickly pans across all the characters that are simultaneously engaged in combat, but that might have stretched the animation budget too thin. The more complex a scene is, and the more moving parts there are to it, the more expensive it gets, and Adventure Time has never excelled at action scenes anyway. While nobody watches Adventure Time for amazing combat choreography, I still do wish we could have had at least a little bit of that for the series finale. Maybe those additional cool monster designs also didn't make it in because of budgetary restraints, but obviously I'm just speculating here. Ultimately though, these complaints do end up being relatively minor for me, because as I already said, I don't watch Adventure Time for splendid action scenes. I value Adventure Time because of its ability to tell emotionally resonating quirky tales packed with humor and surprising levels of depth. So yeah, while a bit of a bummer, it's not that big of a deal because I'm literally just asking for more fan service, honestly. Alright, let's move on. I, of course, have to mention the two kiss scenes that occurred on the battlefield, both of which were absolutely amazing. And no, those do not count as fan service. Those are legitimate developments. Yes, even the one with LSP and Lemon Grab. LSP making her move on the Sour Earl? That romantic advance is not unprecedented. The two had already gone out on a date back in the episode Normal Man. It's stressing me out that there's food on a blanket! I have to go home. This was nice. And while Lemon Grab did cut the date short only to get bonked on the head, he did proclaim that his time with LSP was nice. So this hookup feels like a sensible continuation of that. The two are both incredibly awful and grating, so maybe their combined terribleness could actually work. And their kiss scene was downright hilarious. I think that was the thing I laughed at the most out of the whole episode.
You're welcome. And then, of course, the moment so many have been waiting for, after so much time wondering whether we will get to see it happen on screen, Simon and Betty get to kiss! I do wonder how Simon will break the news about the disembodied AI head he's been smooching. Assuming real-world Simon and the personification of Simon within the Crown Realm are the same consciousness, or share their memories if they're not the same consciousness, Okay, okay, I've yanked your chains enough. Marcy and PB kiss! It's not just gay space rocks any longer, it's now gay gum and gay vampires too. Hell to the yeah! All it took was thinking Bonnie died to make Marcy emotional enough to finally, finally, FINALLY plant a peck on them candy lips. Seriously though, it was so awesome that Adventure Time was able to depict them as romantic partners in the finale. Unlike some shows. <coughs> Marceline's dialogue also further supports that they were indeed romantically involved in the past, but broke up. And while I'm sure most people already viewed the show through this perspective, it's nice to not have to rely on subtext for a gay relationship. We've had enough subtext. Subtext is for cowards. Give me that good shit. Oh, and Marceline can now do that Dark Cloud form. Apparently, when in an emotionally heightened state, she can channel that raw vampire essence that she absorbed back in the Stakes miniseries. That's cool, that's cool. She was already arguably the most powerful fighter in U, and now even more so. After all, she was the only one able to actually take down this monster, even though it just revitalizes and keeps on trucking. While all this was happening, Ice King was attempting to break Betty out of her trance, which thus enrages Betty, and in turn, kills Maja? I mean, Betty herself got exploded before and just ended up on Mars somehow, which was kind of weird. Uh, so yeah, the Maja situation sort of reminds me of what happened in Avatar The Last Airbender with Jet, where it's implied a character died, but it's also left nearly comically ambiguous. Anyway, Betty's plan led to some ironic results. For me to save my Simon, and for you to finally pull Margols back from the Maw of Golb. And yet, her and Simon end up literally falling into the Maw of Golb. Finn jumps right in after them because that's just how he rolls, and luckily only loses his robotic limb in a very close shave. It's interesting how Betty states that Golb's guts break them apart into their essential forms, and Finn's essential form is one that remains armless. It's indicative that Finn has come to terms with his inevitable body that has been foreshadowed as far back as the second season, I think? Back in the episode Breezy, when Finn was at the peak of his depression, his desire was to circumvent his missing limb, because its lack represented a loss of innocence and purpose, among other things. Now, Finn is content with himself. He has self-actualized by accepting loss, learning from it, and growing into a beautiful flower, as Jake recently put it. Buff little bionic baby no more, Finn is now a man. But no, seriously, Finn has really, really grown up. He's been doing so much growing up over the past couple seasons. Jokes aside, he's actually no longer a buff little bionic baby because he chooses to leave the robotic arm behind on the battlefield rather than search for it. And toward the end of the finale, we see Finn chooses to forgo a robotic prosthesis altogether. Thematically, I think that's very powerful, and I'm happy that Finn is happy with himself. I am getting ahead of myself though to all the happy sentimental stuff. At this point in the episode, the treehouse we all know and love gets smashed to bits. <laughs> In order to defend the treehouse, Jake gives it his all. Okay, Jake. You could do this. You could stop him solo. He channels the maximum potential of his stretchy alien DNA and transforms into his blue form that resembles his progenitor. He steals his mindset ready for battle and then gets completely and utterly crushed. The Abomination tag team renders him powerless to protect what he cares about. Standing in the wreckage of the place he called home proves too much for him to bear on top of everything else that's happening, and the poor guy comes down with a full-blown panic attack that makes him transform to be as small and feeble as he feels in that moment. That's when sweet, precious Bimo comes to the rescue and shows why he deserves to be the future king of Ooh. It's okay, Jake. You always try to protect me and Finn. 
but sometimes we are going to get hurt. How about today, you let me be the papa? The song Bimo sings, titled Time Adventure, is so damn good. Rebecca Sugar and Team Kiefer really hit a home run creating it. The first time I heard it in the episode, it sent chills right down my spine and lubricated my tear ducts. You know what? It still sends chills down my spine and causes me to tear up just ever so slightly. Watching this scene multiple times to construct this review was actually quite a challenge because the song evokes that sentimental, bittersweet feeling of something you love coming to an end ever so well, and it makes you happy and appreciative in this weird passive manner, but it also really fucking bums you out, man. Or at least that's the effect it had on me. And for the duration that Bimo performs his art solo, it really does feel like the world might just come to an end. It has this melancholic acceptance to it, a wistful affirmation that the characters' lives were well spent and that it's okay to say goodbye. It was just a very emotionally heavy scene before we find out that Golb's chaos can be reined back by musical harmony. After everyone joins in and unites in musical harmony, or at least something approaching that, the sentiment remains just as powerful, but there's a more uplifting, hopeful, emboldening spirit to it. So let me just get this out there. Using music to combat Golb is pretty cheesy. It's actually really cheesy. It is, I think, undeniable cheese, but it's finely aged, exquisitely crafted, deliciously delivered cheese, and you can find me gobbling down pounds of that shit in the middle of the night in front of my open fridge. The point I'm trying to make with that is that a cheesy concept can still be carried out in an amazing and emotionally evocative way. Also, Time Adventure is such deliberate meta-level commentary on the show itself, the lyrics are clearly reflective of how both the creative staff and us fans feel about the show coming to an end. And it's just hard not to have that resonate with you. It's a two-pronged approach of melancholic sentimentality that hits you right in the feels for critical damage. Also, as Marceline points out, music does not end up beating Golb. You cannot beat Golb with music. It merely holds back the monstrous abominations that Golb unleashed. The musical harmony buys time. That's all it does. Well, the musical harmony also paves a path into Golb's guts through his tummy, which was a little weird, but I'm of the opinion that this is an understandable substitute for having Golb literally shit himself on screen. Basically, music has the same effect on Golb's stomach as Taco Bell would have on ours. And there was pretty clearly an allusion to a bowel movement and a sphincter. Guys, it's clenching! Harmony makes Golb prone to emptying his guts. And yeah, I can totally buy that. I do want to talk briefly about the scene leading up to this, though, because it was heavy, and as anyone who watches this channel should know, I love the heavy stuff. The indomitable Finn actually gave up and accepted that death was at hand. I always figured I'd go out saving somebody. Hey, no one gets to choose how it happens. Had this scene occurred before the big musical number, I would have probably been on the fence as to whether Finn, Simon, and Betty end up biting it. The dialogue delivery is just so excellent in this moment from both Jeremy Shotta and Tom Kenny. It's so real, so raw, so visceral, and so full of vulnerability and love and compassion, it completely sells the emotions these characters are experiencing. I think this is my personal favorite bit of dialogue from the finale, just due to how sad yet loving it is. Okay, so it turns out Death was wrong about Ice King. You're gonna be the Ice King till the sun blows up! Apparently not. Simon is restored to his original personality because Betty chose to self-sacrifice to save not just her loved one, but the entire land of Ooh. I was definitely not the only one wondering how the Simon and Betty plotline would be resolved without sacrificing the elements that made it so tragic and meaningful in the first place. While a happy ending for the two would have been nice for the characters who had been so heavily traumatized, I did always feel that the happy route would not gel that well with the Ice King saga, but I was also curious how a tragic or semi-tragic end might be carried out. 
At one point in time, I considered the one viable good end to be the semi-reformed Ice King and the insane magic woman Betty to accept what the other person has become and love each other for who they are in the present. The saddest part of the Elements miniseries was when Betty could not settle for this. Despite trying her best, she was unable to move beyond the memory of Simon that surfaced every time she looked at Ice King, and she could not accept the person who she viewed as a debased form of her loved one. So after Elements finished blowing through, I could not foresee a happy end for the two. And indeed, the conclusion is assuredly semi-tragic, with the two ending up separated from one another forever. While Simon does get to spend the rest of his life in the company of loved ones, as we see in the montage at the finale's end, he also likely dedicated a substantial portion of his life to pursuing Betty, in a similar manner to how Magic Man pursued Margols, which assuredly does not bode well. The resolution to the Simon and Betty arc is a mixed bag of emotions, and I absolutely loved it. I definitely would consider this an interesting and clever resolution, and I adore the open-ended, cosmic nature of it all. Betty stopped Simon from being an altered immortal entity by herself becoming an altered immortal and omnipresent omnidimensional eldritch entity. She saves Simon from the crown by using the crown on herself and submitting to a cosmic force beyond our own understanding. It's a ramped up role reversal, and it's all just so on point. And it's heartbreaking. The thing in particular that gets me a little bit teary-eyed is that after multiple seasons of Betty determined to be with Simon at any cost, she is able to separate from his life with a smile on her face. However it has to happen. I wish for the power to keep Simon safe. Even if she can't be with him, in her last moments of existing as Betty, she manages to feel content simply knowing that she is able to protect him. That's an emotional gut punch for me. The transformation that results from Betty's decision was a visual gut punch. Going all black and white and graphite sketchy-like, while this sort of visual style is relatively common for intense scenes in anime, I was not expecting this stylistic flair to show up in Adventure Time, and the very first time I saw this, it did take my breath away a bit. On repeated viewings, it's not quite the same level of impact, since for me personally, the unexpected nature of it packed a lot of the punch that was there. But still, seeing Golb screech is still awesome, intense stuff. I might actually love the sound design for this scene more than the animation. That screeching, grinding, contorting roar of the transformation sounds really good. As for the nature of this new god beast, there are many questions that won't ever have concrete answers, as it should be when dealing with eldritch forces beyond our own understanding. How much of Betty's mind still resides after merging with Golb? The Golb Betty meets the gaze of our characters and directs her gaze upwards when traversing through the portal, which is in pretty stark contrast to Golb's dead-eyed stare directly ahead at all times throughout the finale leading up to this moment. While this suggests Gold Betty has an active interest in her surroundings, she did also come into existence as something entirely new mere moments ago, so it's possible she's merely processing the world around her for the very first time in this new body, rather than consciously acknowledging Simon's presence. While it's a nice thought that some amount of Betty's will remains within, you'd think a cosmic entity embodying chaos would be far too overbearing on her psyche. But then again, Betty's presence in the fusion did cause a drastic change to Gulp's visual appearance, so who's to say? And I also have to pose the question, did Golb willingly allow for this to happen because it might lead to a net gain in chaos later down the line? It's all an open-ended mystery. Perhaps Betty's mental influence was still present when she departs from the Land of Wu, but shreds of her original individuality would become more subdued and lost with time, similar to what happens when a person is under the influence of the Ice Crown. I mean, those parallels are like of direct thematic importance, after all. But again, I'm merely speculating, and that's all we can do. 
There are multitudes of reasons why Gold Betty would remain out of Simon's reach. Some reasons sadder than others. And as I said, we'll never have concrete answers, just as Simon himself won't. You've got to feel for the guy. I'm not sure how much comfort it is to know that your loved one's presence can be felt wherever chaos lurks. That seems like something that could potentially even drive you mad. I love the open-ended nature of this resolution. The level of tragedy is entirely open to your own personal interpretation and wherever your imagination happens to take you. This applies not to just the Simon and Betty plotline, but the entire finale, really. There's a reason the creative staff expressed ambiguous opinions as to whether the finale could even be classified as a happy end or not, and that's because it really is up to the person watching to decide how they feel for themselves. Even the stuff that's amusing and comical when it happens, providing temporary relief from the heartache happening all around, like Gunter wishing to be ice king, that still becomes quite sad after you give it 1,000 years. I love the manner in which Adventure Time is able to intersperse comedy between, or sometimes into, tragedy. Every now and again, I have this sobering moment where I have to take a step back and appreciate just how much Adventure Time is willing to portray that life can sometimes suck. Life can be a real grab bag, that's for sure, and I feel like that level of emotional honesty is rather rare in all ages entertainment. But yeah, the silly cyclical wheel of history continues to turn. Gunther's deepest, truest wish was to be like Evergreen, which eventually led to the creation of an Ice King. And now Gunther's deepest, truest wish is to be like Ice King, and that leads to the creation of the Ice Thing, who has an even more friendly, scatterbrained, and wackier personality than classic Ice King. It's quite touching that this is reflective of the love Ice King had and expressed toward Gunther, but now we're about to have one of those sad sobering moments I just talked about, because Ice King's love for Gunther was manufactured into the crown's magic from the machinations of Gunther's mind, because Gunther desired love from his master Evergreen, which he never received. A whole lot of sadness, and madness, paved the way for an eventual penguin, who was actually a monster that existed before time, to fall under the influence of the crown, and experience happiness. It's a fascinating history of passing down desires and perceptions, which led to the ice thing being what he is. And here comes that sobering part about how life can suck. Circumstances later in the future played out such that ice thing still ended up being a victim of tragedy. If some of you are a little lost as to what I'm alluding to, Gibbon, who we see in the new opening, took one of the crown's jewels and reprogrammed it to acquire immortality for himself, which in turn may have led to the ice thing becoming further debased than it was back when Gunter first turned into it. I speculated about this in my video on pups and Do's future, so I guess go check that out if you want more details. The legacy of the crown throughout the series has been extremely interesting. Speaking of uh, tragedy, though, there's more. Oh, Fern. Our dear, poor, tormented boy, Fern. His redemption comes at the heavy price of his physical body, and his final request to be planted at the treehouse makes me want to tear up. Just promise to plant me there. What gets me right in the feels about this is that Fern, just like Betty, was able to be content in the brief few moments leading up to the shedding of the old body and being born anew. Finding a way to be content at the end is most definitely a central theme of the series finale, and obvious meta-commentary for anybody who has ever been invested in Adventure Time, or any show for that matter. Just the small smiles these two characters have gets to me so much because it's so representative of what the series is all about. Overcoming hardship, and even in the most dire circumstances, trying to find a way to be happy. The sword seed that Fern leaves behind turns into a tree upon being planted, with a thin sword embedded into it. Whether Fern is within this new sword, that's again something we have to decide for ourselves, because there's not going to be a concrete answer. Thematically, I feel like loss and transformation bears a more poignant message if Fern is full-on reincarnated as the tree itself, 
the tree that one day will tower high above the land of Ooh. But I can see a case being made for how Fern slash Finn's essence being retained within the sword could be interesting. That being said, life as a sword was akin to a prison, especially in the visual manner that it was portrayed, so I'm not too keen on that rendition of it. As cool as it could potentially be for Shermie and Beth to have a weapon that holds the memories and knowledge of the last millennium, I'd rather have meaning over lore. Either way, the sword certainly embodies the spirit of adventure that continues into the distant future, and that's certainly the most important part. While talking themes here, I also do want to point out how the tree is able to grow big and tall on the foundation that represents Finn's childhood. Finn himself has gotten taller, and is now ready to leave the nest. Finn and Jake have both been shaped by their experiences growing up in the treehouse, but they have matured and are ready to leave it behind and take the next step of their lives. What a nice little sentiment to end Bemo's story on. Of course, I can't end this review without mentioning that we find out who canonically sings the Adventure Time end credits. Music Hole. Music Hole was singing this melody the entire time. That's genius. I want to remind everyone that Music Hole is voiced by Ashley Erickson of the band Lake, who composed the Adventure Time end credits in the first place. And this montage, this amazing montage in the finale, is another thing that just makes me feel like crying. But happy tears! The ending montage puts much of the sweet into that bittersweet feeling of something coming to an end. Rebecca Sugar's Time Adventure provided the melancholic sentimentality, while Ashley Erickson's Island Song provides the euphoric sentimentality. I have always been in love with the Adventure Time end credits music, and it's just beautiful to have the show end with an extended version where we see brief glimpses into the lives of many characters that inhabit the land of Ooh. I could go through the montage and list every fun and amazing little detail that happens, but do yourself a favor and just go watch it instead. I am planning to do an eventual video where I ponder and speculate on the characters' futures, so that's when I'll extrapolate some discussion from the montage. For now, I'm content with just saying that it's a wonderful way to end the series. <sighs> if for some reason it's not already obvious to you, I really enjoyed this finale. Before it aired, a lot of people were keeping their expectations in check and were concerned about whether it would feel like a legitimate end to the series, myself included. I am so very happy with the end result. I still vividly recall the emotional high that I was experiencing after the episode first cut to a close. Knowing that the finale would have to tackle both the gum war and Golb, I was worried that pacing issues might arise, but I think Come Along With Me generally nails it when it comes to pacing, which is an opinion that might be controversial. I've seen a lot of people call the finale rushed, but I just don't see it. The pacing of Adventure Time has always been on the brisk side. I've personally always been astonished by how much Adventure Time can pack into a small time frame without feeling bloated. So yeah, given the context of how this show usually tells its stories, I did not think the pacing detracted from the experience. Now, would I have loved more episodes leading up to the finale? Yeah, sure, of course, I would have loved that. But did I think the finale itself was rushed? No, I did not. The framing device of starting the episode in the future and having BMO recollect events from the past did wonders not just for the world building and the themes at play, but I also think it helped even out the pacing. The occasional flash-forwards allowed us for a quick breather between certain events, while also placing what we witness into a far greater context, which kept things smooth around the edges and rolled them along nicely. The only part that I thought was too abrupt and didn't gel well with everything was the transition from the end of the gum war into the Golb conflict, and you know, the creators seem to have realized this too, because they made the characters joke about it in a way that almost broke the fourth wall. So, uh, I guess everyone's just going home, huh? Yep. Besides that transition, yeah, the pacing was fine. Shortly after Come Along With Me came out, I did skim the net to see what reasons people had for disliking or even hating the finale, and none of the complaints I saw back then resonated with me. Some were precarious nitpicks, others were just desires that were left unmet, some seemed to miss the point of the show entirely, and then there's that subset which makes me want to face table. In particular, I'm talking about the people who continue to whine about how Finn is useless, he's no longer a hero and barely a main character, and 
Yeah, that's not even worth dignifying with a response. And then, I wish I didn't have to mention this, but there's the worst kind of people. The stupid goddamn homophobes. Bigotry is not criticism, and if you have a problem with gay people, I hope that one day you become a better human being, but until then, fuck right off. Okay, let's get back on track, because I am going off the rails a little, but hey, reading people's thoughts on the internet tends to do that to you. So, I've seen some dissatisfaction with so much being left open-ended in the finale. I personally think the creators struck a great balance between tying up certain events while letting others breathe. You don't need Finn's love life to be this concrete, settled thing. Finn is still 17! Let him live his life and figure that stuff out as it comes. That goes for most of the unknowns in the characters' futures. The fact that it feels like characters get to continue living their lives off-screen is not bad. I think it's an amazing testament to the fictional world that was built. People and places are always changing, and Adventure Time was always about capturing a brief glimpse of that dynamic chaos. I love Bimo's response to Shermie and Beth wanting to know more. But what happened to Phil and Jake after that? Or Princess Bubblegum? Eh, hey, you know, they kept living their lives. The lack of closure is deliberately woven into the story and its themes. The adventure is supposed to feel like it's just about to begin. The fun will never end, it's adventure time. That's in the friggin' opening theme to the show. And it bums me out so much that despite it being such a blatant core theme to the finale, some people seem to have just missed it entirely. I really don't have any large-scale criticisms of the finale. Personally, my biggest wish, if I could change something, would simply be for the animation budget to be higher, and as I said before, that's a minor complaint as far as Adventure Time goes. All things considered, I thought Come Along With Me was a great way to wrap up the show and remind us what the spirit of Adventure Time is all about. I am personally completely satisfied. Okay, so we are finally approaching the end of this review, which is great because I've been recording this all in one session and my voice feels like it's about to give out at any moment. Just to reminisce a little bit before I go, I got to witness Come Along With Me a week earlier than its release date, since I was fortunate enough to attend a special screening held in LA. I lived relatively close at the time, otherwise I never would have been able to make it out there. It was a wonderful event that I'm extremely happy I was able to attend, and watching one of my most beloved series conclude on the big screen in a theater packed with other enthusiastic and teary-eyed fans was an extraordinary experience. It's something I doubt I will ever forget. What's amusing is that not a single person there recognized me, or if they did, they said absolutely nothing, which I personally think is fantastic, because the thought of somebody recognizing me out on the street scares the bejeebus out of me, and if it didn't happen there, I don't think it's gonna happen anywhere. Also, I got a shirt that might have been too small for me, and I gifted it to somebody else, and if that person happens to be watching this video, hi, I hope you remember me. Alright, reminiscing over, while this review took an exorbitant amount of time to finish and release, I'm glad to have finally uploaded my thoughts on the show's conclusion. Finding closure at the end can be tough, and hopefully this video is able to help some people out at coming to terms with Adventure Time's end. That being said, I'm not gonna stop making videos about Adventure Time. There's so many events I never even discussed, and so much more discussion to be had about the events I did. The show may be over, but I'm set on keeping the dialogue around it going forever. I hope you all stick around for future videos. Thank you ever so much for watching if you made it this far. If you enjoy my content and want to help me make more, consider supporting me on Patreon by giving me your money. I'm so very, very poor. Also, Twitter, Twitch, I got accounts on those, so follow me if you want. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Mmm, she <laughs>